This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. The long voyage just to reach the stars seems like the biggest challenge on our way to becoming an interstellar species, but we need to establish regular trade between the stars if we're to stay united as an interstellar civilization. So today we'll be talking about interstellar travel and trade and using vehicles known as cyclers. We briefly touched on cyclers for interplanetary commerce in our recent episode on getting to Mars, and I thought it was high time we revisited the topic of interstellar commerce. One of the major problems with interstellar commerce is the sheer amount of time and energy involved in moving anything over such distances. If you want to cut down the time, you have to expend far more energy, and vice versa. Interstellar Cyclers offers us a way to mitigate that problem, at least on regular established trade routes. We tend to assume the hard part of expanding our civilization to other stars will be getting there in the first place, but when it comes to long term economics, getting an outpost planted somewhere is a one time effort that opens up the resources of a whole new star system, and there really is no cost too high in terms of mass and energy to acquire that. Even if getting to and colonizing a system required building a fleet of ships and supplying them with trillions of tons of reaction mass, we could settle a thousand stellar systems while barely scratching the resources available in this one. And we need trade and travel between the stars to be frequent and regular if we want to maintain anything like a unified interstellar civilization. The harder and longer it takes to make exchanges between neighboring systems, the more quickly and widely they would diverge until essentially becoming alien worlds all their own, and possibly even threats. Galactic colonization might peter out quickly if we, or future colonies on the edge of colonized space, feel sending out another wave of colonists just amounts to planting alien civilizations that might become hostile down the road. Such divergence will presumably happen anyway, especially in a universe that doesn't seem to permit travel of information, let alone material, any faster than light speed. Absent regular trade and contact, each system might turn into a fortress, watching its neighbors like hawks for signs of aggression, because they increasingly share nothing in common besides presumably a desire for survival. Now this isn't a big issue in early interstellar days, because it would be a long time before there were any colonies who could offer what Earth has, and our solar system is likely to remain the dominant source of new technologies and data for thousands of years to come. If our solar system develops as we tend to expect on the show, building up space habitats inside every asteroid and colonizing every planet and moon, then we would have living space for quadrillions in the solar system in great comfort, a million times our current population. So even if we packed a thousand fleets off with several million people on board, that still means all those colonies combined have way fewer people than we do back home, indeed probably fewer people than we'd have scientists or entertainment producers. We could easily run rather robust trade, at the speed of light and with no spaceships, simply on information. Of course that begs the question of how those colonies are paying for it. Which they might not be, especially early on it might be sent for free, or at least paid for by folks back here. They probably wouldn't have much information to send home either, but on the other hand, one colony of a few million buying information, needing to sell information back home to billions, trillions, quadrillions, or even more, might be able to fund all their data purchases off a single locally produced bestseller, movie, or vital bit of exoplanet research. However, they can send things back home physically too. Now imagine for the moment you have a vineyard in the Alpha Centauri system, and someone wanted to ship home a bottle of locally grown wine. Someone is willing to buy that wine just for the novelty and probably at a high price. So what is the cost? Well a little bottle of wine massing a bit over a kilogram, trying to make it back to Earth in a couple of decades, at say 20% of light speed, has a kinetic energy of about 2 quadrillion joules. It would be very optimistic to say you managed to speed up and slow it down for that journey for less than 10 times that, so we're talking 20 quadrillion joules. In terms of modern electricity costs of about 5 cents a megajoule, that would be a 10 billion dollar bottle of wine. Someone might buy that, bottles of wine have fetched half a million dollars before, but that doesn't seem like much of a market. Wine happens to be something that generally is more valuable the order it is, the record most expensive bottle was a 73 year old French Burgundy, and if we don't mind the bottle taking 73 years to come home, then that shipping cost in terms of energy is going to drop a ton. For that matter, if they're shipping home gold, we might not care if it took 10,000 years to arrive because it was going very slow and cheap. Gold meandering through space won't be worth what it is when it's stored in a vault, 
but as we discussed when looking at asteroid mining, a commodity doesn't need to be in hand to trade. Gold taking a decade to come back from an asteroid mine will be traded long before it arrives, just probably at a lower value. If you can pick up a gold token for that decade out ingot of gold for say half its value if it were here right now, then you've made a nice profit in a decade, but more importantly you could sell it the next year for a bit more than you bought it for because now it's only a 9 year promise, not a 10 year one. Extrapolating that out to thousands of years is iffy, if we're assuming a civilization that's got life extension technology and great confidence their civilization will still be around then, but the basic premise still functions. The bigger counter to that is that a growing colony mining that gold presumably values it too, and whatever the markdown is to sell back to Earth might be much more than simply sitting on the stuff where you mined it and assuming in 10,000 years its value locally will be much higher, which is a very good bet since a colony started by a million people, visited 10,000 years later, might easily have grown to quadrillions by then too. So going slow to save energy probably isn't viable either, however energy isn't money, We might spend a dollar now to get 20 megajoules of electricity, but the reason it takes so much energy to move something near light speed is that you have to pay an amount of energy comparable to its mass energy. A kilogram bottle of wine with a kinetic energy to move at 20% of light speed still has more total energy tied up in its mass, according to Einstein's E equals mc squared, so looked at from another perspective, shipping a bottle of wine home over several decades might be running you less than a kilogram of hydrogen, the most abundant material in the Universe. Now it's actually fairly rare on Earth, about $14 a kilogram, hardly expensive for a bottle of wine, but would be even cheaper to a spacefaring culture and for instance, we could mine a billion kilograms of hydrogen off Jupiter, for a billion such bottles, for a billion years, and still have only removed a billionth of Jupiter's available supply. A civilization using artificial black holes can pull off that rate of power efficiency, but we still don't even have fusion yet which would be more like a 1% conversion. In fact our best mass to energy production we can do right now is with fission, and that might require more like a 1000 to 1 conversion for relativistic shipping, and uranium currently costs about $165 a kilogram. Key notion though being that if you got cheap fusion, be it regular old hydrogen or deuterium, it's so abundant we would do it, because the cost isn't trillions of dollars or quadrillions of joules, it's just the cost to scoop up some material. Nor does it have to be material, The Sun produces a lot of light and light makes a great propellant at relativistic speeds. We've often talked about using enormous laser sails as spaceships and we'll dig into that more later on, but a key notion is that our Sun produces 4 times 10 to the 26 joules of energy every second, enough to ship 200 billion kilograms per second using our earlier figure of 20% light speed wine bottles. Let's imagine for the moment humanity in the 34th century, a thousand years from now. It's very hard to estimate population growth even a generation down the line, let alone over centuries, and if we're throwing in life extension technology, but let's just say it stayed at a hair over 1%, about what it is nowadays with our current population of 7.8 billion. Such being the case there might be 400 trillion of us by 3020 AD. One of our simplest forms of Dyson Swarms is where you could just put a cloud of thin metal foils around the sun to capture and bounce its light to collectors. It's a pretty cheap way to become a Kardashev II civilization. If they had done that by then, and with that population, 400 trillion, or 4 times 10 to the 14th, then they've got a trillion watts of power generation per person. Folks often ask me why we'd ever build a Dyson Swarm, and the notion of course is that you want all that power, but a trillion watts per person seems insane, and mind you, that's assuming a 50,000 fold increase in our population. Right now there would be 40 gigawatts per person, something like 100 nuclear reactors per person. However if you want to engage in interstellar commerce, and you've got that kind of energy abundance at a trillion watts per person, then some package that costs you 20 quadrillion joules to ship home, like our hypothetical wine bottle, only amounts to 20,000 seconds of your energy budget, five and a half hours. Putting that into more of a dollars and wages analogy, that's about 0.06% of your annual budget. And if we are saying that an individual viewed that annual energy budget as their equivalent to $100,000, then it would be 60 bucks. Needless to say the price is a lot lower if you're not trying to move stuff at decent fractions of light speed. That's also in the context of a solar economy that's pretty literally a solar economy. Jupiter has somewhere around a billion, billion, billion kilograms of hydrogen, 
and if that's your fuel, scooping several tons of hydrogen or deuterium off that planet for a space-failing civilization is probably even cheaper. Now in the long term there's a problem here, as while they might be able to scoop up trillions of tons of hydrogen for fuel, or trillions of watts of sunlight, both for costs that were essentially meaningless to them, there is a certain amount of energy that it takes to run a person. That might be a megawatt for someone using artificial lighting to approximate the sun on some cylinder habitat, or several kilowatts for someone using carefully efficient artificial light in a hydroponics lab, or it might be milliwatts for some post-human living on a computer chip. And whatever that is, that eventually becomes your currency if your population is growing because that's how many folks you can support. If you are at that megawatt level then 20 quadrillion joules represents your one person energy budget of a megawatt for 634 years, many hundreds of millions of dollars in modern context. While those squeezing efficiency out of their power using 10 kilowatts or so, it's more like 60,000 years, or tens of billions of dollars. And for that entirely digital civilization, which probably has little interest in physical luxuries in favor of data anyway, the cost or time energy budget gets into the geological or astronomical timelines region. In any of those examples, assuming you can even afford it, given the timelines involved, waiting longer to get the object at a slower speed and orders of magnitude lower cost might seem well worth it. On the other hand, to one enjoying that huge energy abundance of early growth, they might view 20% of the speed of light as far too slow and be willing to spend tens or hundreds of times more on shipping. That is a key notion though, developing interstellar colonies and developing your own system is something that goes through phases. That dicing on the cheap of thin foil meals is likely something we'd have the technology to build inside this century, as about the easiest thing you can do with even a simple self-replicating machine system. You build a robot, or various species of robot in a supply chain that is mostly or entirely automated, who extract metal and turn it into foil and can build copies of themselves. You do not even necessarily need self-replication either, that's just tech that makes pumping out all that foil so dirt cheap you don't mind building a million times what you need because all you actually built was a handful of robots. Of course dirt cheap production and more sophisticated forms like 3D printing or automation able to mill out virtually any item on demand also interferes with interstellar trade. It's very unlikely any solar system is going to contain any raw materials you can't find everywhere else. Some might have twice as much of something, or even hundreds conceivably, but there wouldn't be anything unique. And if you can manufacture without massive supply chains, then even a small colony doesn't need to import manufactured goods from other systems. Even unique conditions for biology like some alien plant or it turning out that a world with a different set of lighting and local conditions produce the best flavor of some vintage are things easily replicated elsewhere. You can generate any gravity, atmosphere, and soil mix and light spectra you want inside a cylinder habitat after all. This is already a bit of an issue in interplanetary trade and is vastly exacerbated in interstellar trade. This implies that an economy dominated by atomically precise manufacturing, interplanetary and interstellar trade, would either revolve around raw materials or unique goods of various kinds, such as for instance the wine bottle from Alpha Centauri, bought for its uniqueness in a culture where you can have anything fabricated in your home. Alternatively, early on in a new system mass is so cheap that you can be outrageous with it, like sending home trillions of tons of steel propelled by a quadrillion tons of deuterium just to buy you a shipment of a million more colonists or a megaton of various specialty items that are hard to produce locally as you're new. More developed systems will likely take that deal cheerfully, as they can probably recover a lot of the energy by a controlled slowdown or momentum exchange of the shipment, and would always be thirsty for raw materials. That's a much longer time frame and an extreme example of trade though, and for cases of extreme abundance between two settled systems, they have the option of the Stelazo Relay, basically a big pair of mirrors sunk into your star's corona that generate an enormous and tight laser beam for shoving things around, which we explored more in our episode Interstellar Highways. However, trade will always focus on what's cheapest for shipping, all things being equal, and this is where we get to the Interstellar Cycler. A few weeks back we discussed using the Aldrin Cycle concept for moving stuff to Mars. The basic premise is that you can put an object, the Cycler, on an elliptical orbit that makes it come past both planets on a cycle. It burns no fuel beyond starting up and doing minor course corrections. Everything needs to spend fuel to get on board and to exit and orbit the destination, but they can save a lot on stuff like life support and shielding. Thus you can have a big space station habitat that meandered back and forth between two planets and just took on cargo and dropped it off, 
and did so on a minimum energy transfer. Since we make them big compared to most interplanetary spaceship designs and are more station than spaceship, they are often called castles. That's very handy for slow movement of cargo or people even between planets, as there's a lot of life support and shielding needs, that's even more true at the interstellar scale where we can't just chuck a bottle of wine between Alpha Centauri and Earth at high speed or we'll be obliterated during the trip. Interstellar spaceships are always large affairs, they either need to be big to contain all the spare parts, raw materials, or life support needed for a journey of thousands of years, or they need many meters of thick frontal shielding to be able to move at speeds to make trips in years or decades. It's popular to hypothesize some tiny needle spacecraft with a few nanobots and super dense data storage being sent to other stars, but as we saw in the Generation Ship's Exodus Fleet episode, this doesn't really work or make sense. So we always anticipate giant ships for interstellar travel, great big interstellar versions of our cyclic castles fit that bill pretty well. Now you can actually create a long elliptical orbit between two stars, but given that your cyclo speeds need to be in the general vicinity of orbital speeds for those bodies to walk, we're talking trip durations on an order of tens of thousands of years. That might be fine for heavy raw material shipments but not ideal. The cyclo needs to be able to significantly turn as it reaches a star though, however it need not be a 180. One option is to rely on electromagnetics. Stars have very powerful magnetic fields, and magnetic fields can be used to turn objects for free. There is an awful lot of electromagnetics going on in space, and a cycler running out vast lengths of wires could use all that to curve its path around a star. Done right, such a cycler might be able to make long circuits around many stars, and only pay the cost of initially getting up to speed, and quite a speed too, there is nothing preventing them doing this at a decent fraction of light speed. Anything you want to put on them still has to accelerate up to speed to get on board and then decelerate when they exit to rendezvous with their destination as the cyclo moves on. However, this lets us start playing with recovering a lot of that energy we spent accelerating things up. An interstellar cyclo castle could be a huge affair, including one with the capability to be unfolding huge solar sails for power and for pushing course corrections as it gets into a system, and could also be unwinding a long electromagnetic mass driver to hurl ships backwards along to help match local orbital speeds, while giving itself a push too. What's more though, one of the big problems with laser pushing systems is that it takes a lot of energy to shove an object by bouncing photons off it. It's much more efficient at higher speeds compared to other propellants, not even including that you don't have to carry it around, but unless you can bounce those photons back to something else to reuse them, either for power for something else or to bounce them off departing ships or the cycle ship again, they are a bit wasted. That reuse policy is far easier close into a solar system where the cyclo castle could afford a big parabolic dish to shove the energy back to a facility that was capturing it for local power generation. You would have losses, but in such a setup you could have a very high percentage of recovery. Even a small percent though would be enough to justify it for trade purposes and thus make it the dominant form of interstellar travel. If it's done efficiently enough, there's little to no total energy use beyond the initial acceleration and maintenance cost. We tend to think of interstellar laser highways being used to shove spaceships in between two fixed points, a pair of solar systems, and moving at velocities that wouldn't permit much recapture of energy just from the long distances needed for acceleration, but this might be the more plausible scenario. Instead of a giant fixed relay station along the way giving shoves with beams, you might have lots of interstellar cyclocastles running multi-century paths around a circuit of stars who worked in tandem with local ports to keep an acceleration and deceleration lane clear of debris during the rendezvous period and sped or slowed the cargo passing between via laser beams bouncing back and forth many times. Indeed it's very likely such a system would already be in place throughout any given solar system for interplanetary transport essentially pulsing rivers of light for ships moving back and forth with lots of carefully crafted meals to keep that light efficiently reused. In such a case the cyclo doesn't need to be able to do much more than interface with a local system for transfers, and because they are meant for presumably indefinite use and you only have to speed them up once, you can get away with truly massive affairs with huge amounts of shielding, potentially well in excess of even O'Neill cylinders and all of our larger generation ship designs short of planet ships. You might even start producing ships in that size range, though likely vastly lighter, for use as cyclo castles on very long routes. Such a system can be modified to even serve as an intergalactic cyclo. You do have an interesting effect from this too, since they are running a set and known circuit, say one of 26 star systems A through Z, 
the folks at A enjoy an economic advantage for shipping to B, who enjoys the same to C and for importing from A. And that starts setting up economic parallels to a lot of historical trade routes that were dominated by wind and sea currents and many of the cultural and diplomatic situations they had. You can set up such a cyclo path on any path of stars that's reasonably elliptical so they can make the turns at the speeds they're going, so a system might be a port of call to many such cyclo paths, and any given path might have many cyclo castles going on it clockwise or counterclockwise and at different speeds. Given that there is quite a construction cost and energy bill though to setting one up, and doubtless maintenance costs too, there will be much trade incentive to maximizing their use and following existing paths. One caveat though, while you can send these castles out at extremely high speeds, they must be able to turn and things must be able to accelerate and decelerate from them. Your maximum speed is going to depend a lot, especially for the laser pushed and turn versions, on how tight you can keep those beams to allow accurate targeting and reflection back to something reusing the beam, at least if energy conservation is a major concern. Every extra bit of distance either means more loss, or more relays adding some loss and scatter. If I am moving at 20% of light speed, I can't do short turns. I have a 1G turning radius of 370 billion kilometers, 2500 AU, or .04 light years, or 2 light weeks. That's a lot of distance to be keeping tight beams on, though since that is the turning radius you could do a complete 180 rather than a minor correction to the next star. 1G, for all that it's Earth's gravity, is quite a lot of turn stresses to be putting on large objects too. Alternatively, if it was going slower or was just nudging a couple degrees, that could be done a lot easier and closer. Additionally, it can be using a lot of those magnetic turning and slowing methods that get discussed for interstellar ships, either by itself or in tandem with laser pushing. So this is manageable, it's just harder the faster you want to go. Alternatively, it's easier if you're going slower, at half the speed turning radius is down to a quarter, and some bulk freighter of durable goods shooting for a tenth of speed, 2% of light speed, only needs a hundredth of the turning radius, just 25 AU, well inside what we consider the primary solar system out in the Uranus and Neptune ranges. However, we still need to contemplate that kind of acceleration or more for those wanting to catch up. A passenger ship trying to rendezvous with something moving 20% of light speed needs to accelerate at 1G for about 10 weeks, that's 120 AU. Needless to say, many goods could handle far faster acceleration, but people, at least modern humans, probably could not handle much more for weeks at a time. That makes for an irritating paradigm because it's much easier to load durable materials on a fast moving castle, whereas those are the kind of goods where time is none of the essence. Such a castle probably is a community all on its own, maybe even a nation of millions, and folks immigrating using one, even if it's going a high fraction of light speed, are basically not moving to another star system. They are moving to the castle, then many years or decades later, moving to another system. Given that they are loading up at one destination then another and so on, you might get the equivalent of ethnic neighborhoods on board them as 100,000 folks from Alpha Centauri load up for a trip and 20 years later the folks from Epsilon Indy load up, and another generation later the folks from Delta Pavonis do. The crew is likely to change a lot, and amusingly by the time they turn back around the folks loading up might go visit the chunk of the castle inhabited the last time their system loaded locals on board and feel like they were going to a renaissance fair in terms of cultural difference. As a reminder, those things coming and going to the castle do have to match speeds, so they do need shielding same as the castle does, but not as much because they don't need the kind of redundancies and extra layers a big colony ship plowing through space for generations does. Also, you can keep the rendezvous space lane very tightly monitored to minimize the need for extra shielding to handle objects bigger than dust modes. You also have the other big savings of all the equipment and supplies a little ship would need compared to some thick shell giant space castle that can be recycling everything and producing its basic goods. Now you would disembark as you approach the next system, so their local laser array could slow you down, and folks embarking would race to catch up on the castle's way out. So you probably could arrange to have shore leave at the destination system, especially as the castle could give you a little extra shove to higher speed on approach and slow you a bit as you rendezvous to leave the system. That laser beam trick of bouncing it several times works very well for minor speed changes as the distance between the two objects hasn't changed much. The castle, on top of all of its own mirrors, sails, and electromagnetic tethers for turning, can have mirrors and lasers of its own just for shoving around vastly lighter craft not to mention for blowing up space debris in transit, 
so you'd probably have the ability to get smaller ships and cargo back and forth easily during each system's window. Those are big windows too, several weeks at a minimum while it's basically passing through, and would obviously be a big deal depending on how big the castle was and how often they came by. They will likely be constantly expanding themselves, some might be entirely automated regardless of whether or not they had living passengers, or others could effectively be akin to nation states or continental federations on the go, and the castle analogy is fairly accurate because they would be giants with huge amounts of armor, and even ignoring their own power generation and lasers, their sheer kinetic energy makes them juggernauts. Likely you'd see a big range, from automated ones to minor civilizations in their own right, from little drones to small crew freighters to big behemoths. Fundamentally though, simply because this technique is always lower energy than the alternatives we normally contemplate, and because their fairly fixed paths add some stability to trade, I think this is likely to be how the majority of interstellar trade of physical goods and migration would occur on these interstellar cyclo castles. So that will wrap up our discussion of interstellar trade for the day, but we did do an extended look at interplanetary trade a couple years back and we also took a look at how trade might develop between civilizations in our Coexistence with Aliens series episode on trade, and that four part series on coexisting with aliens is exclusively available on Nebula, our streaming service. We also show all of our new episodes there a couple days early and without ads, If you'd like to catch SFIA episodes early and without ads and help support the show while you're doing it, and see that exclusive Coexistence with Aliens series along with other great content from our sibling shows. However, we also have a deal running with CuriosityStream where if you sign up for them at the link in the episode description, you not only get a 26% discount, but free access to Nebula while you're a CuriosityStream subscriber. CuriosityStream has excellent educational content of their own and they are running a 26% discount if you use the link in the description. That's a great deal since it means you get a year of both CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15, and helps support this show and a lot of other educational content, which is what CuriosityStream and Nebula are all about. And again, you can get a year of both for less than $15 by using the link in the episode's description. We mentioned asteroid mining today and we'll be taking another look at that this upcoming Thursday as we consider the role of asteroid mining and orbital settlements in our future, as we continue our Becoming an Interplanetary Species series. And the week after that we'll be looking at space development from the more human side of things as we contemplate life as a space colonist. Before that though we have a bonus episode coming up this weekend, looking at the Fermi Paradox and the Prime Directive the notion that we haven't seen the aliens because they feel morally obliged to leave us alone and stay hidden. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon or our website IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link to the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.